Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about parasitic protozoa, helminths, and their arthropod vectors. Okay, what are helminths? Helminths are microscopic multicellular eukaryotic worms. So again, I told you we're going to be talking about worms this time. They lack a digestive system, so any nutrients they get needs to be already in nutrient form. They have lacking or reduced locomotion. They don't move very well. They are worms. They have a reduced nervous system, but their reproductive systems and their life cycles are very complex with multiple steps going everywhere. And we'll take a look at those in a few minutes. Intermediate hosts are often needed to support the different life stages, such as the larval stage or the other stages. We have three types of helminths, or three groups of helminthes. We have the cestodes, which are the tapeworms, the trematodes, which are the flukes, and the nematodes, that are the roundworms. We're going to look at the first two today, so the cestodes and the trematodes. Cestodes are tapeworms. Yay! Fun! Okay, all the tapeworms lack a digestive system. Like I said, they need to be able to get nutrients from the host in nutrient form. So most of them all have the same type of general body plan. They have a scolex, which is going to be the head area that has a sucker to attach. They've got the hook to actually grind in and make sure that they're going to stay on. Then they have a small neck area. Then you see many, many, many segments. Each segment is called a proglottid right here, proglottid. It starts as immature proglottids, and as we can continue down, they get bigger and bigger into mature proglottids. Mature proglottids have a testes, have a uterus, have an ovary, and they're all ready to actually fertilize and come together. Eventually, they will grow, 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 grow to become a gravid proglottid, which means it has eggs all in it. These gravid proglottids will eventually break off and be excreted in the feces or the urine, then to be picked up again, ingested, and go down into the intestines, and then we got all this nice little doodad. So, let's check out an actual life cycle. So, we got the echinococcus granulosus. We've got the scolex here, that's where it's going to attack. We've got the immature proglottid, we've got a mature proglottid, and then we've got the gravid proglottid. Let's see what happens in the actual life cycle. So we start off with a wolf. This is where the mature tapeworms are going to be. They love to be in the definitive host. So we've got the mature tapeworms in the intestines, and they excrete the, uh, the eggs or the gravid proglottid into its feces and out. Somehow, the intermediate host ingests these. Now, yes. We have humans and we have deer. They could have ingested it because it was on a plant. They could have just come in contact with the feces, but somehow they ingested it. The eggs hatch and they uh, migrate to the liver and lungs, or they just migrate. They try to find somewhere to form hydated cysts. Hydated cysts are going to be these guys. And inside each cyst is a whole bunch of new scoli uh, scolexes. Remember, scolexes are the heads that are going to attach. And each one of these can form the new proglottid. Once we're inside the intermediate host and they've actually formed a cyst, somehow the definitive host digests the intermediate host and eats them. So we can foresee a wolf actually eating a deer and eating one of those cysts. Once the cyst gets back into the definitive host, the scolexes uh, from the cyst attach to the intestines of the wolf and grow into adults, and they form eggs again, and the whole vicious cycle starts again. So, hydrated cyst and the intermediate. They don't do much, but if they get into a bad spot and start to grow, they're not going to feel pretty. This is a human, it's in the human brain, and it's affecting the left orbit eye socket. 
The next type of worm we're going to, uh, tapeworm we're going to talk about is the tinea. The tinea is, is that the, excuse me, tinea. Tinea saginata. Tinea saginata is the beef tapeworm. And then the tinea solium is the pork tapeworm. The cattle and swine serve as the intermediate host. Remember that's where the cysts are going to live. Humans live in close proximities and can also have the cysts um, come and infect and also in uh, high incidence of infection. Cattle and swine become infected by eating the contaminated vegetation. Humans ingest the cesterii in raw or undercooked meat. It goes down into our uh, digestive system, it goes through the stomach into the intestines, and the adult tapeworms hatch and come out and attach to our intestinal epithelium. Once we've attached to the intestinal epithelium, most individuals shed the proglottids without knowing and experiencing any symptoms. The problem is, is that if you get a whole bunch of tapeworms, you can experience intestinal blockage, which is not fun. So, how to prevent this? How to not get tapeworms? Cook your meat thoroughly and freeze your meat immediately to help prevent uh, tapeworms. Moving on to trematodes, we've got the flukes, which are going to be flat, leaf-like worms. We did down here. And they lack a complete digestive system, so again, they have to get the nutrients from the host. We've got an oral and ventral sucker to be able to actually suck onto the host. And they are geographically distributed, is limited to where the intermediate host is. The intermediate host for most of these dudes is going to be snails. So, it's going to be where snails can live. They are grouped according to where they actually parasitize on the body. So, if they parasitize the liver, they're called liver flu. They parasitize the blood vessels, then they're called blood flu. Makes sense. Okay, the life cycle. Humans is the definitive host. That's where we can find the adult. We excrete the eggs through our feces or urine into water. In the water, the eggs hatch into free-swimming neurostidiae. The Miracidiae swim and find a snail, that's going to be our intermediate host, and penetrate the freshwater snail. The Miracidiae reproduce asexually in a snail forming Cercariae. The Cercariae look like these dudes right here, and again they're free swimmers. They escape the snail, they can do multiple things. Penetrate human skin, ow. They can attach to plants and then we can ingest the plant. They can attach to fish, and then we can ingest the fish. Somehow it gets back into the human, which gets back down into the intestines to have it start all over again. Blood flukes or schistosoma are the causative agents of schistosomiasis. Humans are the definitive host through a geographical location. Schistosoma Soma masonii is in the Caribbean, Venezuela, Brazil, Arabia, and Africa. Schistosoma hematobium is found in Africa and India. Schistosoma japonicum is found in China, Thailand, Philippines, and rarely Japan. Again, this is all where we can find that intermediate host. Do you remember what the intermediate host for flukes are? We just saw it. The noodle. They have to show snails. So wherever we can find snails. So the Zuccariae bury into the skin of humans who come into its contact with the contaminated water. These are what they look like in the water samples. The larvae mature and mate in our circulatory system, in our actual blood vessels. Eggs move to the lumen or the lining of the intestines or the urinary bladder so that they can be excreted. Dermatitis, which is a skin irritation or infection, may occur at the site where the superior actually enter the skin and penetrate the skin. 
infections can be chronic and fatal due to the fact that if we have multiple blood sluice, they can actually clog our circulatory system and stop blood flow. Prevention is to improve the sanitation and avoid contact in contaminated water. Now let's actually take a look at what these guys look like. Blood flukes are really kind of nifty because the guy is huge and he has a pouch in which the female thinner blood fluke actually lives. They are known as a split body and they continually fertilize and continually lay eggs. Um, they have the big sucker that allows them to actually attach and then they've got the mouth that they actually can get the nutrients from. Again, human, the eggs come out in the feces or urine, get into the water, the meristidium gets into the snail, it reproduces and turns into the sicariae. The sicariae then comes and penetrates the human and it goes back into the blood vessels and it starts it all over again. This is where I'm going to leave y'all and we'll talk about nematodes in part two. Have a great night.